What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode here at Kibbe Tech. Uh, we're just gonna dive in and talk about these uh, shiny parts right here on our table. We'll start over here with the 3.0 by 18 IBP King Shock coilovers. So they're an internal bypass. The top is a swivel reservoir, so you can loosen that big nut up there, and you can actually turn this reservoir 360 degrees and get it perfectly clocked wherever you need it for your application. And we actually made our own wrench for doing that. Sometimes we use our tools to make tools, which is pretty cool. So yeah, these also have a compression adjuster on the top. So you take this top red cap off here and then you have a adjuster there. Then at the end, it also has a port for a temperature sender for like MoTeC and stuff like that. So this is like, not really a secret, but this is the the secret sauce to what makes our short course link kit work so well. So uh, when these shocks first came out, we got a set and we put them on the gray truck and that had a remote reservoir, but everything else was the same. But we ran that with a short course style four link. And by short course, we mean just, you know, simple trailing arm, triangulated four link, literally a piece of inch and three quarter tube with two bungs welded on with the JMX 16 FK rod ends on each end. So just super simple, you know, we just whip that four link up in you know a couple hours you know four tubes with with eight bungs and it was it was done which now that evolved into you know our new billet style ones which we do on everything which you know we got our machines so we started doing it that way and then when i was making the first set we didn't have the second location here so the first set we made was just straight uniball uniball on each end basically just looked like a big two by four you know billet arm which is what we ended up putting on the heavy Chevy. You know, we tab it this off the bottom of the axle and we had a shock mount, you know, right about here for that, for that shock. Pretty much halfway through machining one of those arms, I came up with the idea to utilize the shock clevis end and then get the shock just a little bit more on the trailing arm, get a little better leverage and motion ratio on the shock. And that's why we started making these clevises. King does make them, but we make our own for what we need to make. And what we need to do. So this runs all one inch uniballs in all three spots and then we make all the misalignments for this and then we make these clevises with the shock adapters which you see here. We make those, we make stainless inserts where the bolts go. So that was just kind of the evolution of uh, the short course trailing arm. So like a regular short core or regular four link would be like what you see in all the trucks on the other side of the shop. It's just a big you know fabricated or billet trailing arm with a coilover bypass off the middle. So the whole point to doing the short course setup is simplicity. So like, you know, the back of this truck, you got a pretty, you know, fairly simple bed cage with, with coilover mounts and a bump mount and a short course uh, four link. And it's still pulling about 21 inches of travel. And we didn't have to cut the back of the truck off. So all the other trucks, you know, full back half, coilover bypass, you know, once you get into that point, you're cutting the back of the truck off, the price is just double and triple in parts. So some people have done it with just a regular 2.5 coilover or even like a 3.0 uh, pre-runner series uh, shock. And it just, they just don't seem to work as good. So every time we do it, we use this shock. That's the go-to, the 3.0 18 IBP race series coilover. And like the gray truck, the first time we took it out, we were pretty blown away with what it was capable of. And we actually never shock tuned it. All we did was we loosened up the compression a little bit right there. and. That's all we ever did with that truck. You know, you saw what that truck has done. So another thing, you always see us using these uh, 12 point aircraft bolts here. So we run these for a number of reasons. First is strength and it's just always a perfect fit. So say this would be the bolt in like a grade eight bolt. So it's still, you know, without washers, it still gets through there pretty decent, but there's a pretty decent amount of threads still inside here. So basically, if that was the proper size bolt for this, you know, we'd have a bunch of threads on the inside of the pivot there, which you don't want that. So if you put this bolt in there, you get perfect engagement on the shank through the pivot. So by the time you put nut and washer on the other side here, you see that right there. By the time that's tightened down, that's a perfect fit. 
and that ain't going anywhere. So look how much shank is in the pivot there. So it's all shank, no threads inside the pivots. So every bolt, I'll measure every pivot on every truck, and then I'll translate that into a part number, and then I'll order the perfect fit bolt for every single pivot on the truck. So it's a lot more than just, you know, walking over to the bin and just grabbing whatever bolt fits and slapping it in. Which also you can do, you know, usually buy a longer bolt, something a little longer than this, and then you end up cutting the threads off and then you shank the bolt yourself. But then you end up spending time cutting bolts down. You know, say you have a set of $6,000 rear shocks and you got a $6 bolt, or you just buy the $60 bolt and then you can reuse this for years. So, I mean, if you're racing, you know, replace them, you know, a little more often than that. But pre-runners and these things, you could use them, you know, for a long time. And if you notice here, it's a perfect fit. So like, say if it's like the rear end, and it's fabricated, you know, some things move a little bit when welding or you get some powder coat. We'll ream every pivot with a 5 8 reamer and then the bolts fit in perfect on every pivot. So every pivot on that truck, you can put the bolts in with your finger. So no hitting bolts in with a hammer. That just, you know, goes along with like prep and stuff like that. And that makes future prep work a lot easier. All right, another cool thing you see sitting on the table here is another part of the evolution of parts here. Third member. So this is a billet third member from TubeWorks. Everyone should probably know what a third member is if you're into off-road. So most are just like a four nine inch style, you know, cast iron housing with usually a billet cover here and then a usually a cast yoke here. So TubeWorks came up with this new design and it's actually all machined out of billet aluminum, one piece, much larger bearing here, you can see that. Bigger bearing up here on the front. Overall, just better unit than, uh, than you know, the old junkyard stuff everyone's been rebuilding for years. But if you wanna know more on this, I would just go to TubeWorks website and just read up on it because it's a lot more than just a, a fancy looking billet housing. And this is actually the third member that's going in the Raptor. So I believe we went with a 488 because we're gonna match the front with 488 as well. Full spool right here, that's a 40 spline. And you can see TubeWorks came up with some pretty cool uh, locking hardware here. And then they came up with a new front support bearing setup as well. They machine their yokes in-house as well. Pretty excited to start running these on a lot of the trucks. We got five of them in so far, and I got to order probably another five. I don't know if you saw, we got some in gold as well. Of course, you know, if it's billet, you know, we're gonna try to get it in gold. Yeah, so just basically this, all this stuff on this table is all the same stuff that's going in this truck right here. These are actually the shocks for the Raptor. Just another, another part to the puzzle and another uh, cool part in the evolution of off-road parts. Back here on the chrome truck, we weren't really gonna talk about this one today, but it was sitting here and the hood was open and I don't think we've ever showed the front of this thing with the hood open when it's pretty much complete. So you see we made a lot of panels in here, kind of enclosed the radiator so it gets all the airflow. You really see a lot of the detail, you know, with the hood open. Obviously we need to make a hood prop still. We just got it propped open with the prop rod right now. Yeah, lots of details under the hood on this thing. Lots of stainless ARP bolts everywhere, lots of billet parts. You know, bitch and air cleaner housing there. ID Designs front plate, power steering solutions, billet power steering pump, DC power, billet alternator in gold, Mazier billet water pump. If you notice, it's all ARP bolts on the engine. So that was pretty cool. We put that parts list together actually, and then uh, had our buddies at ARP get all that set up for us. You know, you've seen a lot of this thing before, but just was sitting pretty over here waiting for paint. So we figured we'd show you uh, some of the details. Yeah, there's no skid plates on the front right now. Uh, someone decided they wanted to scratch the anodized gold skid plate. So we sent it out, got it stripped, repolished, and it's getting re-anodized right now. And then we're putting polished mesh behind that. And then the side filler panels will be polished with gold mesh behind that. If you look underneath, we got all the polished skid plates bolted on the bottom. So the skid plates are aluminum and they are polished on the top and bottom side. So even the inside that you don't see is polished. Another over the top detail on the chrome truck. Right, Scout? All right, quick little D90 uh, progress support. We got the front tubes in, 
We got the bungs through the frame. So this is a one inch 250 wall bung Pro Molly that goes all the way through the frame, welds on both sides, runs a long bolt through there. And we got two threaded bungs, uh, 3 8 24, threaded in the frame here. So that holds the top and this holds that through. So that'll be just enough to you know keep the front of the frame from moving around because we're still gonna have steering box on this side and a track bar. So the track bar mount, steering box, and just the horsepower and just everything moving around. You know, I wanted to make sure the front frame rails aren't gonna move at all. So yeah, up here, you see it's a little different. So these spots are actually identical. So the tubes from the side, they're perfectly at the same angle and the same kick out, but obviously the firewall's different from side to side. So each plate had to be a little different. So these are in there. And then next, we're gonna run the tubes to the top of the shock mount here. And then that'll keep these from moving. And then, uh, yeah, and then after that, we're gonna put the whole front end of this thing back together get the steering sorted out, get the track bar sorted out, final welding on the firewall, and this thing's pretty much done for all the major fabrication. Back over here on Dan's truck, you see we got a lot more tubes in. So we got all the rear tubes in. You see this one, this one, that side, the one down here, this one. They're working on the ones from here to here right now. We got all the front ones in. So just like the other truck, this establishes a good place for the floor, for the seats, for the center console area, uh, trans tunnel. And then we're gonna add another tube somewhere in this range for the front seat mount. And then that'll just be sheet metaled over. We're gonna have like the other trucks, access panel here, probably one on the top, and then probably one on the side, on that side, or maybe both sides to get to the bell housing bolts and to get to the plumbing. Also, we got the maximum off-road close ratio reed case 4L80 in there. So say like the 2-3 shift usually drops, you know, a bunch of RPM. With this trans, it'll actually be just a closer ratio. So you won't drop a bunch of RPM in between shifts. That'll be nice, especially with the 40-inch tires. It's got the big 1480 uh, yoke on the back there, all billet, Mark Williams yoke. It's got their billet tail shaft got our uh, rear chans plate which is just mocked up right now on these tabs just to hold it in place next step i just ordered the drive line to here so it does run a carrier bearing with a two-piece so i will get that drive line in we'll tab that out for the for the first section of the drive line and then um, after we get the third member fit in the rear end we'll, we'll order the the tail section of the drive shaft a lot of tube work going in on here next step we'll start sheet metaling the floor and the firewall once all these tubes are done and welded up here on the front of uh, dan's truck you see we got a the lower water line in there. We got the power steering reservoir slash cooler in here. So same setup we did on the white truck we did here. We figured that worked really good on that truck. So we just did the same thing over here. And also we did the same uh, AC condenser mounting style in the front. So works great up here. And then I uh, have plenty of room for the plumbing and all that. Just slowly checking everything off the list on this thing. Uh, back over here in the machine shop, you hear all the machines humming away, as they should be. GM 2500 2011 to current upper uh, replacement control arms. So these will bolt on your stock truck. Uh, these are different than the coilover conversion upper arms. So we decided to make these so you can run, uh, have more options for backspacing on your wheels. And uh, we did 50 sets of these and they're pretty much all done. I think we got like five under there left. So. By the time you watch this, these will all be at Anodize or back from Anodize and then uh, getting shipped out. Pretty excited about these. We did uh, 50 more sets of these and 50 sets of the tie rods too. So we got a 2011 to 19 or 2020 to current uh, GM 2500. We got a bunch of cool stuff for you to get that thing riding right. Check it out at kibbytech.com. All right, question time. Favorite time of the day. How do you keep your neighbors in that complex from complaining about the burnouts and noise from broken wrench? Sorry about your wrench. Uh, <laughs> mess around for five minutes after hours when everyone's gone home. It's pretty much no one around to complain about that. So that answers that. Any more Raptor builds in the future? Yep, there's two more on deck for similar build as that one. Why don't you use diesel platforms? Well. 
We've showed my diesel before, but really those diesel platforms are just a little, I think they're just a little heavy and it's not really the truck you want to build to be jumping and going through the desert, you know, through big whoops and stuff. It's possible, but the front of those trucks are really heavy. So you'd have to move that motor and trans back a lot. I like gas engines and naturally aspirated engines to where you have just a built motor that just has throttle response right when you hit the throttle. So say you're coming up on a on a hole or like a bump and you want to like chop the throttle to set the truck up to pop the front end. Can't really do that with a diesel. How do you get around emissions laws? Well, I don't. The customer has to take care of that on their own. <laughs> Dang, was gonna guess most builds ran 60 to 80 grand. I'm in the wrong business. Uh, 60 to 80 doesn't even cover the parts for some of these builds. Uh, some of the motors are 25, 30 grand. Transmissions are 15 to 40. So there's your budget right there. <laughs> Shock package is around 26 grand for one of these trucks. The parts add up quick. So everyone always forgets the parts. Has there ever been a video of someone playing the drums? Yep, they are mine. I used to be in a metal band for about 10 years. Um, I play them about once a year at our Christmas parties. Why well, don't see manual trans on pre-runners? They don't really make anything. There's no point to a manual trans. I mean, to impress somebody, I don't know. But uh, the 400s and the 480s and like the sequential trans that you see more in the trophy trucks, I mean, doesn't get any better than that, especially the newer sequential transmissions that everyone's running. So there's sequential six speed or five speed automatic. You can't shift faster than those. So there's no point in running a manual and no, it won't blow up the rear end with a manual. It'll probably blow up your manual before the rear end. These are my favorite. Emoji, sunglasses, thumbs up, 100. Thank you. <laughs> Where did the gold fetish come from? Uh, I just always liked gold and no one was doing it and it was just i really like that color and it looks good on anodized you know like anodized billet parts look good in gold so that was my color and i just always stuck with it do we do any of the ford i-beam suspension uh yes and no i probably won't ever build a i-beam pre-runner they're cool they work good like the Innovate KT F500 that we built, that's on I-beam suspension and that thing's super cool. I'm just not really passionate about I-beams, so I probably won't ever build a set. I think that's it. <sighs> Boring. Well, here's a good question. Uh, how do you decide when designing your tube structure between using bent or mitered junctions? Is it purely a packaging issue? Thoroughly enjoying the videos. Thanks for taking the time to make them. Well, thank you, Jet or if to. Pretty much everything you see, you see a lot of miters. So basically we try to do as minimal bends as possible. So if you have like a bunch of bends everywhere, I think the chassis will just kind of look bubbly and ugly and it doesn't really give you a corner junction to land all your, your tubes and your junctions. So if you look, every junction, you know, has a, usually has a miter in it and then there's a bunch of tubes landing in that sharp point of that miter. So if that was like a big bend, then you would just have kind of tubes all over the place and for like paneling and stuff like that if you use miters then all your panels kind of have a home just based off of your your tube layout also for like processing like lasered tubes if you laser that tube and it's a miter joint it's done you don't have to send it out to get bent or you know bend it yourself post process so that's always nice as well we got another question of how i started in the garage working with a buddy so that is another one I'll have to, we're gonna answer probably in a complete episode and it probably will be more than one episode because that, that's going pretty far back. So, all right, that's it for now. Thanks uh, for watching, like, subscribe, tell your buddies. Hey Murph. <laughs> nice mustache. <laughs>